All right, just a quick disclaimer before the video starts. Just wanted to let you guys know that I don't work for CASA and I'm not a lawyer, so take anything I say with a grain of salt. It's just meant to be used as a guide. So it's there to open the discussion. So if I've got anything wrong or you want me to talk about anything else, just leave a comment and we'll address it sometime in the future. So thanks for watching. All right, we've finished all the boring fundamental stuff with the standard operating procedure. In the last two videos, I covered that. So if you haven't seen those yet, go back and watch them because you'll sort of need to know about that before watching this. But basically what I'm going to do now is dive deeper into the visual line of sight regulation and what it means to you as a drone pilot. So just to recap, the visual line of sight regulation means that you must always, as the drone operator, keep the drone within your own visual line of sight. Um, basically that means that you're not allowed to use any visual aids at like goggles or telescopes, binoculars, other cameras, those sort of things to observe it. You have to be able to see with your naked eye um, the reason behind that is that if you were to lose uh, contact with the drone via the radio control, um, you would need to be able to pilot at home safely. And if you are in the goggles, obviously that's going to be much, much harder. Or if you're relying on binoculars and those sort of things, you, it's going to be nigh impossible. Um, so you do need to be able to see it as the, um, the drone operator with your naked eye. And just working on physics and mathematics, um, generally that's somewhere between 600 and 1200 meters, um, depending on the light and the size of the drone and those sort of things. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Some drones will have a warning for this, um, some won't, but um, it's a pretty easy one to keep an eye on yourself because if you can't see it, you can't see it. All right, so as a hobbyist drone pilot, you really do have to, in most cases, stick to the visual line of sight regulation. Um, it's one that I see hobbyists break uh, most often. Uh, it can be unconscious or conscious. Sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes they want to be a cowboy. Sometimes people just don't know. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's, uh, if you're a hobbyist, you really do need to stick to it because there's no real way that you can explain your way around that. The other thing to take into consideration is that um, when you're flying in camera and using the camera itself or the goggles, you have no real situational awareness to what's going on around the drone. Um, so it's uh, very limiting. So having um, someone to see the drone is very, very important. Um, so yeah, the drone operator as a hobbyist in particular, you really need to stick to that. And like I said, it's uh, one that I see very often broken by hobbyist pilots. So for commercial pilots, it's a little bit different. Uh, with the right licensing and certificates, um, as mentioned in video episode two, um, you can actually apply to CASA and there is different um, uh, classifications for beyond line of sight or um, extended line of sight operations. Um, so you can, with like I said, the right paperwork and certification, um, get permission to do that. Obviously, you'll have to pass all of CASA's safety um, certification and protocol, uh, but as a commercial pilot, that's something you can do. So um, if you go get your licensing and do all that, that's one of the rewards. Um, it is costly and time consuming, um, and most of the time, it's definitely not worth it. But if you have a job that really does demand that sort of thing, um, then you can look into that, but you will need to be commercially certified for that. And as I said, uh, video two covers that more in depth. Some of the reasons you might need to fly beyond visual line of sight as a drone pilot would be, you know, if you've got something that's a, a very big long range job. Uh, we've had a couple of mapping jobs where um, flying beyond line of sight has been important. Um, but generally that's uh, something that you can um, mitigate with good planning. Um, the other reasons you might want to fly beyond line of sight or break the visual line of sight regulation is to fly the FPV drones. Um, obviously that's a really interesting topic at the moment and something that um, I'm definitely going to touch on a lot more. So as I said before, as a hobbyist pilot, you really do need to stick to the, the visual line of sight regulation, but there is a, a couple of things that I'd like to say as sort of workarounds or caveats within the CASA regulation that you can maybe use to your advantage. Um, and the first one is obviously in regards to FPV drones, like I was talking about with the goggles. Um, it's obviously a big up and coming thing in the drone world at the moment and everyone who's into drones wants to give it a go and I can promise you it's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, very big learning curve but a hell of a lot of fun. Um, so the caveat that you have is that if um, you obviously if you put the goggles on you've, you're not able to see the drone. Um, so the first thing you need to always have is a spotter. 
Um, as you'll sort of see in my videos, there's always someone there. They're not always in the frame, but because um, I don't always want to be in my videos, but uh, uh, I always have a spotter there to, to spot me. Um, and the other thing you have to do um, to make everything um, above board is um, participate in the, the Model Aircraft Association of Australia, the MAAA. Um, if you join the MAAA, and there should be a local club nearby to you. Um, and it costs me about $300 a year to join that club. Um, and I can fly at their airfield um, and use a spotter. I still need to have a spotter there when I'm at the airfield flying. Um, and it allows me to practice and use their facilities under their um, guidelines. Uh, but it allows you to get an experience with the FPV and um, you know, spread your wings, so to speak. Um, so it's really good fun and I suggest that's the best way to do it. It's also a really good way to share information and meet people who are like-minded because there's a lot of information you need to know about this sort of stuff and it is a really good way to um, yeah, see, see what else is going on um, in your area. Uh, so just to be clear, um, what I'm talking about here is when you join the MAAA uh, Model Aircraft Association Club, um, that as a hobbyist allows you to um, practice your FPV and go have fun with those guys. Uh, but if you're looking to make money from it, that's still going to be a difficult thing because you'll still need to then um, go off and get your drone pilot's license and remote operator certificate. So um, those I spoke about again in first and second video. Um, so you can go back and watch those if you want more information on that. But basically that's going to be pretty costly uh, and expensive. And on top of that, uh, there's another certification you'll need um, and I haven't used this or, and I'm not at this level yet. I'm still a recreational uh, FPV pilot, um, but you'll need to have an IREX certification as well for certain FPV work. I've been talking to a few people about this and obviously it's very new here in Australia. There isn't too many commercial FPV pilots. Um, I don't know any. If you do know any, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to chat to you about what's going on there. Um, but yeah, basically um, you need the IREX certification potentially from what I've heard. So um, yeah, look into that more closely, especially if you're looking for financial gain and FPV for piloting because um, there's definitely opportunity there, um, but having all the, the ducks in a line and, and being certified is gonna be important. So just quickly, there is another uh, workaround to the visual line of sight regulation for FPV. It's not as good, but um, it could work for you. Now, what you can do is you can actually get a screen and plug it directly into the goggles, and that will give you a vision of what the drone's seeing, and you can have a go at doing that. I did that early on with the DJI FPV system, and it's really what um, gave me an insight as to what FPV might be like, and I can honestly say that um, I don't regret diving in after that. So. Um, it was a good way to start off. I don't think it's viable long term. Um, as soon as you want to hit the manual modes and, and do a bit of acro stuff, it really doesn't hold up there. Uh, but it can be a good way to um, you know, test the waters. So that pretty much wraps it up for the visual line of sight regulation, I think. Anyways, in the future, I'll definitely do more videos on the extent of line of sight and beyond line of sight options you have as a commercial drone pilot. But for now, I just want to keep it simple for the everyday drone pilot. As I was saying before, I think the visual line of sight uh, regulation is the most misunderstood uh, and the most commonly broken. Definitely when I'm talking to uh, people who are looking to buy a drone for the first time, it's one that they, they are not aware of or don't understand fully um, or, or, or definitely need a bit, a bit of help with. So um, that's one that I wanted to do a video on first. And obviously with the FPV, it's very close to my heart at the moment. So it sort of explains a little bit of that and maybe more people will come flying with me. So that's a big ups too. So again, if I got anything wrong or you think that I should talk about something or add something in, just leave a comment below and don't forget to follow, like, and subscribe. Help us out. Um, spread the message about these videos. It's not all about gear. Um, spread the word about the, the laws, the regulations, what you're meant to do, what you're not meant to do. I think that's the best way to open up the discussion and maybe change things or, or just make things better. So thanks again for watching.